All right, guys, thank you so much for having me. Um, just so you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some slides for about 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll move on into a demo. I like to play with fire, so I'll probably embarrass myself with a terrible demo. I hope everything will work out. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm not a data scientist, and uh, I'm not really a data visualization person, but uh, I am a researcher. For about 15 years, I was in uh, astrophysics slash information science. My field is now called astroinformatics. There's new fields appearing at all times. Um, and uh, I worked a lot in research. I published a lot of papers, about 20, 25, just enough to know that it's a painful process to write and publish research. And uh, the reason I started Autoria is to really try and you know, solve some of the inefficiencies that I found as a researcher. So I normally speak to uh, academic audiences, uh, postdocs, professors, university departments, and uh, um, uh, research institutions. So I actually, I'd love to uh, get a raise of hands. How many of you still, well, not still, how many of you are actively writing and publishing research papers? Well, actually, okay, that's not bad. And can you leave your hand up if you use LaTeX? Okay, so that's almost all of them. Okay, I feel sorry for you. Uh, <laughs> and I, LaTeX is a, uh, for those, is anybody have no idea whatsoever what I'm talking about when I say LaTeX? Okay, well, this is a very technical crowd for some reason. Uh, but um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have a couple of slides uh, that make fun of LaTeX, which is a great tool. Uh, I use it at all, at all times. It's, I have a love-hate relationship with it. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Since it's a technical crowd, I'll, I think I can make some jokes and we'll have fun. Um, so in a nutshell, what I can say is that uh, today and probably for the next two, three days, uh, you'll present a lot of great tools, platforms, interfaces, technologies for data visualization. And uh, I'm, I guess that a lot of them are directed you know, to the industry, uh, but a lot of them are also directed to scientists. You want scientists to use these tools. And I have bad news. Scientists will not use them because they cannot publish data-driven interactive documents. So what we're trying to do uh, at Authoria is we're making a platform that allows scientists to produce uh, the research of the future, which includes data-driven interactive uh, visualizations like the ones that you've been presenting today, which are fantastic. Um, so I like to start my talks with the slides, even when I talk to scientists, believe it or not, um, which pretty much sums up my frustration and the rationale uh, behind building something like Authoria. Um, so I think that we all agree that by definition science is cutting edge, novel, original, it's the new cool stuff, right? Otherwise it's not science. So by definition science is 21st century uh, and that's what scientists do. They produce 21st century research. Then if you look at the tools that scientists are using to write up their research, they use Microsoft Word by and large and LaTeX. So now you probably don't know that LaTeX is only used by a small percentage of academics, about 10%. Physicists, computer scientists, statisticians, mathematicians. Everybody else in scholarly, in, in scholarly communication in academia uses Word. Um, but the most frustrating part is that we're still packaging research in something that looks like that. That paper is 350 years old. Could have been published yesterday. It's just text and images, right? That's what we publish. Um, now, if you take a step back another 50 years, 400 years ago, uh, Galileo, um, um, Italian astronomer, one of the founding fathers of the scientific method, published this paper. Um, the front page now, they look a little different, but uh, I'm going to show you that if you look inside the paper, uh, the paper that is 400 years old looks in format and scope similar to the papers we publish today, but there are some differences though. Um, just so you know, this is a paper that uh, uh, is the first observational evidence for uh, satellites revolving around another planet and it's the, as I said, the ob observational evidence for a heliocentric system. So it's one of the most important papers ever published. Um, and the way Galileo brought it, uh, if you look into the paper, this is an English translation, because at the time English was not uh, the main uh, language of uh, scientific communication. Uh, there wasn't much science after all. So um, if you look at the paper, it actually has a very descriptive narrative account. Galileo is telling you where he's going with this new instrument called the telescope, uh, where he's pointing it to, what kind of telescope it is. There's a lot of metadata on time, location. Uh, and then he's pretty much just, just describing all the stuff that he's annotating in his notebook. Um, and then he's got images. And images are pretty much the drawings that he, he was taking. 
So you can see the circle in the middle is Jupiter, and then you have the stars, the asterisks, uh, the satellites around Jupiter that keep moving. So uh, there was no photography 400 years ago, so the best way for Galileo to actually depict and um, uh, report his results was to actually draw them on a piece of paper. And that's what he did. Um, now we're still pretty much publishing research in this way, but Galileo really had an annotated notebook. So he pretty much took a lo lot of notes and ended up publishing all his results, images, everything that he had, all the different assets and research outputs that he collected. Now the problem is that we collect a lot more data. Uh, uh, until 20 years ago, we would put it at the end of a paper in, uh, in the appendix, in tables, very long tables, pages and pages and pages of tables. Now data has become even larger, just doesn't fit anymore, and we don't publish it. So we end up publishing very superficial, high-level accounts of our own research. Uh, and this is really bad, because science then is not open, it's not reproducible, uh, it's not transparent. Uh, there's also like something to be said about the public trust in science is eroded if we don't publish our own data. So my question is, if we had a much more modern Galileo living today in Brooklyn, for example, like a hipster Galileo, um, and he had to rethink scholarly communication, what would he do? Well, I'm pretty sure he would not choose the PDF to be the vehicle of scholarly communication. Uh, he would probably be collecting a lot more data and he would probably be publishing Git repositories, for example, or other forms of uh, interactive, data-driven uh, channels of communication. Um, so that's roughly, that roughly is the motivation for building Authoria. Now, you probably don't care about this, but when I give a talk to academics, they always say, well, what do you know? Like, we publish all our data as a link. We just put a link always somewhere that points to the data. So with a, a few colleagues of mine when I was at Harvard, um, we uh, did a study and we looked at all astronomical literature, pretty much from the beginning up to, uh, you know, about uh, seven years ago. And uh, we looked at the occurrence of data links inside papers. And you can see the bars, that's the volume of links that you find in papers. And what you will see is that uh, the gray part of the bar is the links that don't resolve anymore. They just return a 404 or have, uh, you know, 503 or one of those. Uh, um, codes that is pretty much telling you that the data is not there anymore. So that's, that's really bad. Even if those like gray bars were like 1%, that would mean that 1% of scientific data that was published in a given year is gone. That's not 1%, that's like sometimes 44%, which means that we've lost all the data, and this is in astronomy, that was produced. Of course, I, I'm, I'm lucky I'm an astronomer by training. Uh, we publish a lot of data in open public repositories, so data is actually not lost, but what I'm talking about here is not original uh, data, but it's data that is processed by the, by the researchers in order to produce the graphs and visualizations that end up uh, printed as JPEGs inside PDFs, which is, again, a terrible way to, uh, to do science and scientific pub publication. So um, a couple of years ago, with a colleagues of mine at, uh, I think this is Harvard, UCLA, and Microsoft, and the Space Telescope Science Institute, we decided to write a paper, or reimagine the paper of the future. Uh, paper, right? It's not really like supposed to be a paper. Uh, it can be in paper format, but it has to be online uh, first. And it's a paper that would um, include uh, long-lasting, rich records of scientific discourse. Uh, so data, code, interactive figures, audio, video, and of course commenting and things like that. So in order to write the paper, we also had to write uh, a platform where this paper could be written. So that, that was the beginning of Authoria, uh, which I'm gonna, as I said, demo in a, in a few minutes and we'll see how that goes. But the idea is that it's, Authoria allows for uh, uh, a very rich editing experience for scholars. Um, and uh, in addition to text and images, it allows people to really add um, more interactive data-driven things like, um, I'll show D3JS, uh, plots uh, and IPython notebooks, code, anything you like pretty much. Any sort of research output you have can be included uh, inside Authoria because all it is is really a, a Git repository. Um, this is the front page which I'm going to show in a second. I just want to mention the fact that our focus is on reading, writing, citing, hosting data, and publishing uh, research. So we're also trying to do a couple of other things. Since we were solving the whole like, uh, you know, reproducibility thing. We said, hey, what other problems exist today in academic uh, publishing and writing? 
And one of them is this problem. Um, now, uh, if you use LaTeX, pretty much you might have a similar problem. There's some great tools online to write LaTeX together. Uh, um, uh, the, as I said, the vast majority of people use Word, though. Uh, the idea is that whether you use LaTeX or Word, versioning is a problem. Now, I guess that 100% uh, of the people here know Git, so I'm not going to spend any time discussing the uh, people actually relate when they see that. When they see the final, underscore, final, underscore, final, they see themselves in that uh, uh, name, in a way. Um, so we solve the problem by using Git as a back end. Uh, sometimes when I talk to people that don't know Git, I say that it's like tracking changes in a document, because uh, that's what, really what we're doing. And we just introduced a system of uh, smart merges, which I'm not going to discuss too much, but you can come and talk to me about it. So in, in, in other words, we're uh, committing to the repo at all times, and when we find a conflict, then a little pop-up like that shows up that asks the main author what action you want to take uh, if there was a conflict in the Git repo. So it's really cool stuff. It's really like something like doing track changes and allowing people to, uh, to work on their own, uh, on their content. and. Uh, um, Instead of, I mean, we could have gone a different direction like Google Docs where every single uh, save is you're rewriting uh, someone else's work. We decided to go with this one because authors want to have authority and control over their, their work. Um, and of course, we're all about data, so um, every single article uh, has a Git uh, backend that you can access. Any single article you create, you can also access the data folder view. This is an example of an Ebola paper that I'm going to show in a second uh, that was written entirely on Authoria by uh, some researchers in epidemiology. And I'll show that they publish their, the data inside uh, behind every single one of their, of their figures. Um, of course, we allow interactive data-driven uh, plots. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, from Jupyter Notebooks, D3JS, Plotly, CardoDB, uh, and pretty much, you know, bokeh, flowcharts, anything that is pretty much JavaScript plus HTML. Um, these are two examples. One is built with uh, Plotly, the other one is CardoDB, and I'll show them in a second inside a real article. So um, the other problem that I had when I was a student, uh, PhD student, was that I was writing my dissertation using LaTeX, and my dissertation advisor was like, look, I've been doing my job for 30 years. I'm not going to learn LaTeX. So I'm just going to give you comments on the side. On the So I would have to print, produce a PDF, send it to her. She would print it and then give me the comments on the margins. Uh, it was always a mess. It would extremely uh, um, slow down my process. I think that we can do better than that. Uh, and we can have a way to talk uh, between these like, uh, very opposing uh, communities, the later community and the word community. And uh, the answer is to really use a format that we use every day, uh, which is HTML. Um, so just another joke about LaTeX. I don't know if you ever had that warning over full HBox, which I never understood how I actually like remove it. But the idea is that LaTeX it was really built for the print world. And now we're producing a lot of content on the web. Uh, and uh, the way that we built, that we dealt with it, is that we use a, a system called um, LaTeX ML, which is an uh, HTML representation of LaTeX, which works really well. Of course, it doesn't do things that uh, you can only do in the print. Uh, so if you say, please change the top margin to be two inches, well, there's not top margin uh, on the web, or maybe there's only one. So uh, all this, thing, like page numbers, all that stuff, of course, uh, does not apply to the to the web. Um, couple of things that probably don't really uh, interest a lot of people here, but we also allow, we work with publishers, we allow easy submission of papers to uh, different journals. Right now we support more than 8,000 different styles, and we have a few hundred different styles that do not only the citation references, but also the, the look of the, of the paper. Um, we're all about open science, so similar to uh, the way that uh, um, platforms like uh, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab, or our catalyst for open source, we're very much in the open science movement. We're starting slowly to introduce metrics that really encourage authors to do uh, to share their data and you know put their work in the open. We're running a data challenge uh, with the White House and actually a couple of other ones with NYU and Columbia to really um, um, get people to write papers and include their data in, 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 in their papers. And we have prizes for that. 
Um, so finally, probably, I mean, I don't know how many of you have published a paper, but it probably took a long time. Maybe not as long as from there to there, but it definitely took a long time. Uh, most journals take forever to get a paper from uh, uh, submission to publication or even acceptance. Uh, and uh, there's no reason that the system has to be so slow. So we're trying to really rethink the way that not only we write research, but also uh, we uh, get the paper, get the the results out. And we're very uh, um, big fans of preprints, the idea of a preprint, which is a great legal way of getting your uh, research out to the world as fast as possible. Uh, just one word about who we are. We're based in Brooklyn, actually not too far from here. We're about 10 people. Uh, that's a photo from the off office warming party we had uh, uh, last week. And we're also hiring. So now it's the scary part. Can I just ask how many minutes do I have? How much do I have? 15, okay, so that's fun. Um, so I hope it works. If it doesn't work, well, you know, we'll just, uh, I'll go back to slides or I'll take questions. So this is our homepage. Uh, and uh, as I said before, like our focus is on reading, writing, citing, hosting and publishing. I forgot to put hosting up there. Um, at the top here, you'll see a couple of articles that have been uh, uh, written on Authoria. There's a lot more. We have about 5,000 articles that were written on the platform. And some of them were, publi you know, were published elsewhere. For example, this one, the Ebola paper that I showed before, was published in Cell. So um, this is the idea of a preprint. So the idea that you can have your papers hosted elsewhere and then still publish in a major uh, journal. Um, so what I wanted to show here, for example, this is the browse page where you can see some of the stuff that is being authored, you know, like just a minute ago, three minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. Some of these things are drafts. A lot of them are open, which is fantastic. And, you know, again, we're trying to encourage people to do um, open work. So before I show some of the, maybe I should show one example first. So this is the Ebola paper that I was mentioning before. It was written by about, by about 25, 30 people at the Broad Institute. Uh, it's the very first paper was uh, on the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. It was covered by the New York Times. Uh, as you can see, it looks like a normal paper. I can even open uh, the version that was published in Cell. So I can, you know, I can just even click on one of the citations, and it's going to take me down to the reference. So this is the way that the paper looks, but it's also the way that the paper was actually written. It was written in the same environment. Um, if you go to the... Uh, the very top left uh, uh, drop down, you can see that you can also access, I'm going to open them in a new window, the data folder view and the history view. So what this does, um, this is going to load the Git repository behind this paper. It's a little slow, but it's getting there. Oh, no, here it is. Um, that's the Git repository behind the paper. So as you can see, there's a bunch of markdown files. This guy's actually wrote the entire paper in markdown, which is great. Um, and, uh, but there's also, I think, some tech somewhere, so you can mix and match different formats. Uh, if you go to bibliography, you can actually download the entire bibliography f uh, for the paper. In this case, it's in bibtech format. Uh, and if you go to figures, you can actually navigate and browse the figure structure. And if there's data behind any of the figures, you will find it here. You can also just go back to the, to the main view and download the entire paper from here. Uh, sorry, export. The entire paper is a zip. Um, you can also fork the paper uh, from here. So I could just fork the paper into my own uh, uh, repository. So the idea of forking a lot of the ideas that you're used to uh, when you work with Git, uh, we also have implemented them. This is the uh, published version in Cell, which is not loading, uh, but it has a link back to the uh, Authoria version. In addition to the data, uh, the authors also made public the history of the paper. So this is every single edit made by every single person on this very important cell paper. So as you can see, Daniel is the last person that did, made the edits. Then if you keep going, you'll see Andrew and Shirley worked on the paper, then Stephen, Pardis. So all these people were working pretty much on this day at least uh, together. And this is a very granular um, uh, view. You can see, for example, that in this change, uh, the red stuff is what got removed, and the green stuff got added. Uh, I showed this to a scientist, and he said, too much information. But the idea is that you know, if you want to share the history with, uh, of your work with people, you can do so. We're actually in the process of re revamping the history so that you can see uh, the diffs inside the paper uh, itself. 
Now, um, let me just go ahead and I'm going to create a new article, and I'm just going to at least show some of the, uh, the features that uh, some of our authors really like. So uh, I'm going to call this article PlotCon Live Demo. All right. So then uh, this is an um, example text in. OK, now I can do things like bold. And as you can see, can you actually see that? Well, it's not. Maybe let me just try and make it bigger. All right, maybe too big, but you can see it now. So the idea here uh, is that I can do things like bold and italic. I can also use the toolbar up here to make things bold and italic. So it's a you know WYSIWYG editor, very simple. There's nothing nothing like too uh, too crazy. Um, the, uh, I will show you in a second, yes, thank you. I uh, will show you in a second how you can also combine different uh, pieces of text like LaTeX, Markdown, and different formats. But what I wanted to show you is that uh, the most, one of the most fundamental features we have is the citation. So I can say, let me add a citation to a speaker. And uh, since already a couple times Fernando was mentioned today, I'm going to add, uh, I'm going to see what Fernando has published around the IPython. Um, so this gives me pretty much, we search Crossref, which is an open uh, repository of every single article that has a DOI, so everything that pretty much got published. So in this case, I searched for Fernando and IPython. I got a, you know, pretty much all of this is like re stuff that is related that was published by Fernando. I'm just going to pick the first paper here. Uh, and that creates a citation and immediately a reference at the bottom. Um, Academics actually spend a lot of time just doing this sort of thing, formatting references, adding citations, which is a, a total waste of time, I think. Uh, I can also add an equation. So let's try and do that. One second. Uh, like, um, so this is another feature we have, is the equation editor. So I can do things like x squared equals a plus b, OK. Uh, and at the same time, I can also edit the text source in the background. So instead of B, maybe all I meant was gamma. Then say insert, and that's inserting the equation. This is not um, compiling anything. It's, it's not PDF or a GIF in the background. This is actual HTML. So you can even copy and paste the equation, and it will copy the, uh, the LaTeX behind. Uh, what else? I can, uh, OK, actually, I'm going to add some lorem ipsum, just to make the paper a little more, more fun. I think I have some saved here. Uh, OK. All right, so now the paper looks a little more complete. And now I'm going to go ahead and insert some LaTeX. OK. All right. Um, so this is now a LaTeX block. So now what happens is that I can highlight this LaTeX. I can make it bold. As you can see now, the toolbar is acting um, as a LaTeX editor. So it's giving me the text BF. And I can add any um, equation. And I have saved here. Don't worry, I'm not going to spend 10 minutes writing a LaTeX equation. I have one here and uh, another one. Uh, sorry. OK, here we go. All right, now we have some LaTeX in the same document. Now uh, what happens is that the moment I click outside of the box, the LaTeX renders into uh, actual text that people can, can read. If I click back inside, I can just edit the, the LaTeX. That's how it works. In the LaTeX block here, I can also do things like citations, any complex LaTeX thing that you can think of. Uh, as I said, limited to the things that are possible on the web. So limited to what LaTeX ML can do, which is actually quite a lot. And I'll show you in a second uh, some of the power of LaTeX ML. You can actually do a lot, a lot of stuff with it. Um, and I'll show you some examples of papers that were actually published that have a lot, a lot of uh, mathematical content. Um, so the other interesting thing here, of course, like you can add things like images. And I'm going to show you a little um, more complex things in a second. But I can add an image and add a a caption, an amazing caption. OK, here it is. Um, now, at this point, if I'm kind of happy with the results of my paper, I can go ahead and 
explore the paper. So what we've done here up to now is just content. We haven't looked at the format in any way. So I can say uh, I lost the export button somehow here. Where is it? Here, OK. Um, so when you click export, now it gives you an option to download, export a paper in PDF. And as I said, we have like about 300 different styles. Uh, if you're submitting to a computer science uh, conference, ACM, you just select that and you say, give me the PDF. Uh, so what you do is we produce, we run all of that stuff through a later compiler, that's a secret. And uh, we produce a PDF that uh, looks and feels with all the citations, references, tables, data, uh, sorry, not data, but uh, tables and images formatted according to the uh, ACM style. If ACM rejects your paper, all you have to do is go back here and just pick a different, pick a different journal. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, idea, the idea is that we, you know, we really make it easy. We're format agnostic, so there's a total separation between the content that you produce and the format that you uh, export it in. Uh, you can also down download to thank you download to uh, uh, Word. You can get a LaTeX file. Here, the interesting thing is, think about it. We, some of this stuff that we wrote is like a mix of uh, HTML, WYSIWYG, and LaTeX. We could also add Markdown, but you can export back and forth between any, uh, any formats, which I think is really cool to uh, allow people to work together. Uh, in terms of working together, you can also comment on any part of the text. I'm not going to show the commenting now. Um, there's a couple of other things that I want to show that ha have to do with the, uh, the data component, right? So I did tell you that there's a data folder behind every paper, so let's go take a look at it. Uh, here it is. So as you can see, we built a bibliography folder for you that contains, well, the only uh, um, citation that we put in there. There's a figures folder as well. And if we go into the figure folder, we can add things like uh, a CSV file, which now is part of the, uh, of the repository and of the article. And we can also add things like an IPython notebook. Um, now, the interesting part is that if we go back to the, to the main view, since we do understand that there's an IPython notebook, we create a special link that, that says, hey, there's an IPython notebook behind this image. So uh, what we do here is that we, uh, we spin a Docker container, uh, and we run the IPython notebook for you. Uh, and here it is. So I can just click on it and access the actual notebook, which probably has some problems in there. But the idea is that we allow not only the authors, but also the readers to access the data behind, um, behind an image, so that you pretty much publish all the data, content, code that you have that you use to produce an image, and it's available inside the paper. So data, code, travel with the paper, which is pretty cool. Um, now, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to show. I have s some papers here that are open. So one of them is the um, D3JS. This is an example, for example. It's a, uh, it's linked uh, panels in here. I can highlight stuff in one, and it shows in the other ones. Probably not as exciting as the stuff you're showing, but what I wanted to say is that if you go to the data folder view, you can see that there's a JS folder. So all the JavaScript, all the data, everything is inside, is living inside the paper. Um, a couple of other examples. Actually, this is work that I just picked up from, the, from our uh, homepage, which I found is cool. This is on AR. This is on Wildberry Production in Boreal Forest. I don't know what that is, but it's cool. So I thought I would just show it to you. Uh, this one, I think I wanted to show it to you because it's got some pretty heavy LaTeX, so it's uh, pretty intense. Yeah, there you go. So I think if I go down, there's even more. One sec. Yeah, there you go. So I just wanted to show that there's some possibility for doing actually quite a lot of uh, LaTeX. This is a, another paper that I find very interesting because it's um, a new collaboration at CERN. This, this paper was written by 250 people working together. Uh, so again, when, you, when we talk about large-scale collaboration, this is the type of collaboration that we can enable. Really a lot of people working together. Uh, and again, this is a CERN uh, paper published in the Journal of High Energy Physics. And I think that I'm just going to stop there. Cool. Thank you. OK. I, I have one minute for questions, so maybe two. I don't know, one or two. Yes. Uh, 
And at the moment, what, what, we, what we offer is a GitHub integration so that you can uh, sync your, I actually should have showed that, you can sync your paper with a GitHub uh, repo, and that allows you to essentially do whatever you want with it. You can push and pull, and the changes will, of course, appear in the authority article. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question was, how do you handle merge conflicts when you have a lot of collaborators? Um, so first of all, it might be surprising to you that people, since they've always be, been used to say, hey, I'm working on the paper now, so nobody touches it for the next two days, people are still using to, to the paradigm. So even though we're trying to get people to work at the same time, it's sometimes they just don't do it. They're like, oh, Tom is working on it, I'll work on it tomorrow. Uh, so it, actually, we don't see as many conflicts as we would like, because we actually want to solve that problem. Uh, but what we do is, I uh, talked before about smart merges, so we merge at all times. When a conflict arises, the main author will get a pop-up showing the actual, uh, so it's a, we have a very simple conflict resolution mechanism that allows people to, uh, uh, to solve them. Okay, thank you.